Well, of course, I must take exception to uh, being categorized as, as one of those old men who sits around and grumbles about the decline of Western civilization. Uh, as um, Stan has just alluded to, uh, I, in fact, got up from my seat, uh, mounted my horse, rode off to the west, to Texas, to West Texas, to see what we could do about rallying the academic forces on behalf of the serious study of Western civilization. So partners, I'm a man of action. Just want to let you know that. Um, you saw the figures. That was actually a presentation that I made at Texas Tech back, back in October, and, and they show the precipitousness of the decline in the study of Western civilization. Uh, it's attributable to a number of things, uh, to some degree to the general dissolution of the curriculum. There just aren't very many requirements or even clustered courses that you're sort of channeled into uh, anymore uh, for a variety of reasons. It's the potpourri approach. Um, but uh, that said, um, there are two reasons other than that. Uh, why Western civilization is in decline as a taught subject. And by the way, it's in decline as a taught subject at the high school levels as well, where there are requirements. Uh, it used to be that sort of capstone history course, often an AP course for uh, students in a high school, would be Western history, and that is being replaced, as we speak, steadily by something called world history in which all civilizations are given pretty much uh, equal time and in which the emphasis is on the interaction among civilizations. Uh, which, which, you know, I'm, I'm for more history rather than less. I'm not against teaching courses like that. They have hard to teach. They cover a vast, vast amount of subject matter. Uh, but, but you know, it's, it's, it's valuable to learn about how civilizations have interacted. Um, the argument for those courses, uh, the explicit argument for those courses, both at the high school and at the collegiate level, uh, is that after all, we now live in a global community. Uh, and as members of that global community, as aspirant global citizens, we really have to understand the world as a whole. We can't have a parochial view uh, we're going to be out there, presumably, in our later careers, dealing with people from all parts of the world, ourselves traveling to all parts of the world, and we have to know about them, and we have to know about how humanity has interacted over the entire course of its history. Well, okay, uh, it has a certain kind of, of plausibility, uh, but I think it forgets the single fact about this modern global world that we now live in. And that signal fact is that it's a Western creation and that its commonalities are almost entirely Western institutions, be they the institutions of uh, the market economy, international capitalism, be they the institutions of constitutional government now spread around the world or at least given lip service to around the world be even they the institutions, we still have some of those, of, of, of radical uh, projects like, like communism and socialism. Where did that come from? It wasn't invented in China, you know. Uh, be it science and technology, uh, be it pop culture, be it almost anything uh, that the world now shares in common, uh, bad as well as good. They came out of the West in the last few hundred years. I'd argue that their roots go more deeper, go deeper than that, but they certainly developed to their full maturity uh, in the last few hundred years in the West. And hence, if you want to understand the global community that we now inhabit, this new world, other civilizations will certainly be contributing to it in the future, but if you want to understand it as it is now, you really have to understand the West first and foremost. It has to be given priority. Now, 500 years ago, it might have been an intelligent approach to look at all the great civilizations in parallel. Doesn't really make much intellectual sense, in my opinion, now. But there's yet another reason 
goes along with the first reason, but I think it's distinct enough to be given separate mention. There's another reason for studying the West. Uh, if you, uh, I have some brochures from our Institute for the Study of Western Civilization, and the icon of our institute is a statue that actually sits in front of the library at Texas Tech, and it's a statue of Prometheus. Western civilization has been Prometheus. Western civilization has brought about, I dare say, a metamorphosis in the human condition. What's happened in the West in the last few hundred years in, in its significance is second only, I think, to two other events in the known history and prehistory of our species. Uh, to get to the next event as important as what happened, going back into the past, as important as what happened in Western civilization, you have to go back to the agricultural revolution, which certainly transformed the human condition and set the stage for civilization uh, in any shape or form. And to find another event of equal importance, you have to go back to the speciation of humanity, uh, whenever that occurred, uh, 120,000 years ago, perhaps, in which we became a sophisticated symbol manipulating animal uh, and hence had the c capacity for culture of any kind. I think those are the only, only two episodes in human history that are as significant as what we have just in the last few hundred years in the West gone through. We live lives that the aristocrats of the past, a few hundred years back, would have gaped in wonder at. We all know this, well, I don't know how, how much the millennial generation knows or recent generations. It's easy to take for granted uh, that this wonderful cocoon in which we live that shields us from so much of the adversity of living, it's so easy by simply custom to take that as something that's natural, that's a given. Of course, it's, 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 it's not. Uh, since 1850, the life expectancy for someone uh, at age 20, so forgetting about all the advances in infant mortality, it's gone up 20 years. Um, talk about the aristocrats of the past. First king of England, first monarch of England to survive to the age of 70 was George II in the middle of the 18th century. It took that long for the guy at the top of the food chain in his society, so to speak, who had everything going for him uh, to make it to the age of 70. Of course, there were some occupational hazards of being a king. But even, 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 if, even, if, even, even if you look at the ones who didn't die at the battlefield, you know, they, they kind of popped off in their 50s, mainly, in early 60s. Same thing's true for Chinese emperors and people like that. So we're living in a world that our ancestors would have regarded as magical, uh, a world of ease, of comfort, of being able to take out our cell phones and having the entire virtual library of Congress at our, at our fingertips. I mean, it really is something that we live in this world. And uh, it has its problems too, no doubt. I mean, nuclear weapons and uh, all sorts of other things, uh, the dark side of Western civilization, the totalitarian projects and all of that. But uh, for those of us who think that it's a net plus, even for those who don't like it, Certainly, you'd have to want to understand it in order to figure out what to do with it. Even, you know, if you want to get rid of it, if you want to understand it. But certainly, if you want to preserve it, you should want to try to understand it. And it seems to me it should be at the very top of our list of civic commitments to try to understand it. The interesting thing, now that's, that's sort of the intellectual curricular argument as to why it should be there. And obviously, we're, we're also dealing with a kind of emotive, visceral rejection of the West as a symbol uh, in many quarters in the intellectual world and uh, in, in academe. Uh, the interesting thing about this rejection is it is done, usually, in the name of causes that are themselves Western and the products of Western civilization. Um, if you think that the West is uh, this terrible patriarchy and, and, and you want to achieve a kind of feminist emancipation, well, you're a Westerner in so thinking. 
If you think that uh, we are technologically destroying the environment and we have to get back to some sort of more natural, sustainable state, then you're a Westerner in so thinking. If you think that we live in a miserable, exploitive, class-dominated order in which the rich are getting all the wealth and, and everybody else is unfairly kept in check and you think that's a grave injustice and can be changed to something more egalitarian, well, welcome to the club of Westerners. That's exactly what you are. So the visceral, you might say, rejection of the West is very Western, comes out of the West, uh, and is symptomatic of a society that in some sense is at war, a civilization that in some sense uh, is at war with itself. Kind of anomalous when you think about it. I mean, obviously, civilizations in the past have collapsed, but they usually haven't collapsed from some sort of autoimmune disease uh, in which there was a vast internal repudiation of their foundational and iconic institutions and ideals. Uh, that's not usually the way civilizations in the past have died um, or have even been seriously endangered. Uh, and I guess we all wonder, I mean most of the people in this room uh, would think that Western civilization has been a remarkable success, has been a wonder. Uh, we wonder, therefore, uh, why all this is happening. What is the root of this internal war, this internal rejection? Uh, of the West's and its of the West and its its varied in, uh, achievements, and I I think the answer really isn't all that complicated. I think there is in fact a simple answer to that question. The reason that the foundational iconic institutions and ideals of Western civilization are under such severe assault is because they can be. They allow themselves to be. That's something that's very different from any other circumstance I know in the history of past civilizations and societies, or for that matter, many of them uh, now present elsewhere. Uh, if in times past one had taken issue in China with the institution of the empire, with Confucian morality, uh, with any number of other things held in reverence, you would have been fiercely repressed. If you had done it in the Islamic world, well, in the Islamic world today, you'd be fiercely repressed. If you had done it in Europe four or five years, four or five hundred years ago, if you had kind of questioned Christianity or the king or wherever you happen to be, you would have felt the brunt of the coercive power of the regimes then in place in very short order. Here in the West, you can do it for fun and profit. We have as a result of having freedom. Freedom is wonderful. Freedom has created all our creative endeavors. It's kept tyranny at bay. It's made possible a world organized around constructive, agenda, uh, constructive endeavor. Uh, the victory of, of liberalism, in the broad sense of that word, in the Western world has meant age-old terra, the sword of state, was sheathed and is only taken out now under very rigid protocol, just like, for example, a policeman on the beat can't even draw his gun unless certain kinds of well-defined conditions, part of his training, have been satisfied. So too, as that happened with the terrible swift sword of state. We live in a society in which Violence has been domesticated. Coercive control of the powers that be has been caged. 
and that has unleashed a tremendous amount of productivity. It means, here's one of the great anomalies of the contemporary West. If you look at the entirety of human history, there may be a few exceptions here and there in small little polities, but if you look at the entirety of human history, those small number of exceptions aside, where, where do you find, what, what way of life in the past has produced the greatest amount of wealth, the greatest concentration uh, of wealth and status? How, do people, how did people, in, for time immemorial, uh, most successfully become vastly wealthy? They most successfully became vastly wealthy by taking the wealth produced by others. Most early, most civilizations right up to the present were based on what you could call a taker ascendancy. The richest people, the emperors, the kings, the nobility, kind of lived off the privileges uh, that their ancestors had achieved and that they continued to enforce uh, by coercive means. They were takers. If you now make a list, you can do this online. Go to Google and plug in uh, the world's richest people, the, the 400 billionaires, testified billionaires who are out there in the world. Uh, you know, Queen Elizabeth isn't one of them. <laughs> she, she, she's worth about half a billion. She doesn't make the list of, of billionaires, uh, except for a few Saudi princes who probably still qualify as part of the older order and one or two other people like that. All these folks are folks who got their money by making things. They're not takers, they're makers. But that kind of success for making can only happen when something neutralizes that terrible swift sword of state coercion. And that's what we have achieved in the Western world uh, with the advent of liberalism understood broadly, constitutional government. All these things we think are natural, they're so unnatural. They're so anomalous. But what they do, in addition to unleashing all this creativity, not just commercial creativity, but intellectual creativity and literary creativity, artistic creativity and scientific creativity, uh, all these things, they also put in jeopardy this whole project of, of making and creativity because they open the way for the system to be assaulted at very low cost. They create incentives by the very freedoms that they confer to go after the system, to resurrect in new forms the project of taking, to play and not just for politicians, and kind of all politicians are now kind of doing this. It doesn't even matter what their party is, it's part of the political game. Uh, uh, to, to, to create opportunities for demagoguery. Uh, politicians supposedly, you know, representing the interests of people, but, but often it's in their interest to go out and mobilize grievance, make people feel, even in a situation in which most people should naturally think very well of themselves and, and where they are, to make them feel that they're losing out, to make them more keenly aware of the natural frustrations of life and of invented frustrations that politicians can bring forward. But it's not just politicians. Politicians would be relatively powerless to do this. They're not usually that gifted in imagination. They're, they're also demagog de demagogic uh, strategies that can be pursued by people who are in the business of cultural formation that advance their prospects uh, in the academy, in journalism, uh, in entertainment, making people feel dissatisfied, holding up objects of dislike and envy is a way for those who do it well of advancing their own status, their own power, and also generating income streams, very big income streams. And when that can be done, you've created an incentive. You've created an incentive, in a sense, for self-civilizational hatred. And I think that's the situation we're now in. We have an economy, we have a, a, a regime that's sort of disarmed, that's allowed freedom. The freedom has produced tremendous amount of productivity and, a creativi and creativity, but also uh, an, uh, an opportunity uh, for those to uh, take up cudgels 
against it. Um, the history of the Jewish people uh, testifies to the danger of having, Jews were during even period of, of their ghettoization, uh, were commercial people, uh, were economically successful, uh, produced wealth, but at the same time were weak uh, in terms of the ability to defend themselves, uh, the ability to uh, exert force on their own behalf if they were attacked. They were disarmed people. You know, in a way, all of Western civilization is in that very same position writ large. It has immense wealth, but it's disarmed itself. It's not really in the same kind of circumstance to mount a defense, to deter attack, as other civilizations have been at other times. It's a tempting target because there's a lot there to go after, uh, and there's not much price to pay in going after it. So it's a, there's a, a natural incentivizing process to kind of get into the cultural predicament we're in. Is there an answer to this? Well, uh, I, I think uh, one answer can come through, through the academy, uh, through an effort to more strongly to convey to current generations the preciousness of what they have and the importance of looking after that common good that this great, free, productive civilization uh, constitutes. Um, constructing perhaps a somewhat better narrative, something more exciting and heroic uh, on behalf of uh, this wonderful prosperity, creativity generating enterprise than we currently have, but certainly studying it carefully, teaching about it, and hoping for the best. Uh, all processes are, all complicated processes, and our civilization is one of the most complicated phenomena, human phenomena, ever to emerge on the face of the earth. They were all unstable internally, and we're seeing that unstableness right now. Uh, hummingbirds have tremendously fast metabolisms, just like you might say Western civilization. Enormous creative energies, but they don't live very long. Um, everything that we do, I think, in this great civilization of ours is tremendously precarious. Uh, it consists of a kind of tremendous uh, conflation of, 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 of elements that, that are remarkable but don't fit all that well together. And so we have to work very hard if we want to keep the show on the road, if we want to sustain this great civilized commitment. And um, the NAS exists to do that. Uh, the Institute for the Study of Western Civilization, and I'm delighted that Texas Tech has, has made a home for it uh, out in Lubbock, is going to seek to do that. Uh, and whatever the future holds, um, I think all of us have an obligation in our individual ways, however pessimistic we sometimes feel, to do our utmost as well. There's nothing guaranteed about this. It's a great anomaly, and we're going to have to strive very hard uh, to keep it going. So that's my message. Thank you. <laughs>